Hi, I'm Anna Zimmerman Jin from the Analysis and Insight team at the Skoll Foundation. Um, wanted to welcome you to this session. Is it possible to measure systems change? This will be an interesting workshop in which we um, explore different methods for measuring systems change and talk about some of the challenges inherent in that process. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our facilitators for the day, Peter Drobak, Alex Nichols, both from the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship here, and um, Anna Burney from Forum for the Future. Thank you. Good morning. All right, hope you're excited to be here. We're thrilled to have you. Um, this is going to be a workshop. It's going to be interactive. There's a ton of expertise in the room, and we're looking forward to, um, to hearing from, from you. So welcome on behalf of the Skoll Center, and uh, you know, let, let's get right into it. So, so first, a show of hands, just so we can get a sense of who's in the room. How many of you in the room are uh, doing systems change work as practitioners, as investors, as academics? Great. How many of you feel like you have a good grasp of what we mean when we talk about systems change? Raise your hand. I'm kind of like here. Uh huh. <laughs> and now the question of the day, is it possible to measure systems change? This is like the pre-test. Show of hands if you think, yes, it's possible to measure systems change. All right. Show of hands if you're not sure. Uh huh. And maybe a last question. I won't take hands here. But when we were chatting about this and preparing for this session, Alex posed the provocation, should we be measuring systems change? Um, and so this is the kind of stuff that we're going to be exploring today. You know, there's two things that everyone in our space is talking about these days, the big kind of memes. One is systems change, and one is impact measurement. And we arguably don't have a great grasp of either of them. And in fact, these two things are often in tension, right? The trends in impact measurement are, um, are oftentimes about distilling complex work and complex interventions into a very narrow set of indicators or sometimes a single indicator. Um, and for some, an impact investing, great if we could have one indicator that cuts across organizations and context to measure impact. But systems change is almost by definition about wading into complexity, embracing interdependency and context, and accepting that the one true constant is change, um, and that actually to be effective, the work needs to be constantly evolving. So how do we reconcile these two things? How do we understand um, cause and effect um, when systems change is by definition nonlinear? How do we think about claims of causality? These are the kinds of things that we want to explore during our session today. Um, at the School Center for Social Entrepreneurship, uh, we believe that systems change is kind of at the heart of what uh, differentiates social entrepreneurship from other approaches to change making and that's why systems change is really becoming a central concern in our teaching and our research and I want to just briefly mention a new initiative that we're launching here this year a research initiative called the systems change observatory and, and, and what we're doing here this is a sort of an exploratory observational research project we're trying to capture the up to two decades of experience among the 111 school awardee organizations that are all working towards systemic change across across issues, across geographies, and across different kinds of approaches. And our goal is to try to capture this collective experience and see whether from that um, begin to emerge frameworks or patterns and pathways to systems change that might help to demystify um, this process that's really easy to talk about and hard to do. Um, sitting in the back corner, Professor Mark Ventresca who's waving there. Uh, one of our colleagues here at the center uh, is going to be leading this research effort. And if you're interested, please talk to him or myself after the session. OK, that plug out of the way. Let's talk about what we're going to do. We were asked to make this a workshop. We're going to be talking at you for just a little bit. But the idea is actually really we're going to work together. Um, and, uh, and we have a terrific couple of facilitators. Um, Alex Nichols is uh, my colleague here. He's the Skoll Professor of Social Entrepreneurship. He helped to found this center back in 2004. And he's a leading scholar in a whole bunch of different fields across social innovation and entrepreneurship. He's published like six books and 100 papers, the first book on social innovation, the first book on social finance. Um, he's been thinking about this stuff for a long time. 
Um, Anna Burney is one of our co-conspirators. Uh, she's the Director of Learning and Community at Forum for the Future. Many of you know a, an organization in London that works with businesses, NGOs, and governments um, to um, help work towards sustainable futures with really a systemic change approach. She also founded and leads their School of Systems Change, which is really trying to grow this as a field and empower systems change agents. So it brings a really nice blend of kind of academic and practical uh, experience and expertise. So let's talk about what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to begin by giving both Alex and Anna a few minutes to kind of set the stage, frame the issue a little bit, and introduce some potential frameworks for thinking about how we might measure systems change. Anna then is going to introduce an exercise that we're going to work on together in small groups with one such framework that help you kind of think about how you might approach a systems change measurement question. And to do that, we'll introduce three mini case studies on three organizations that happen to be school awardees who are approaching systems change um, efforts in really different ways. And we'll use either one of those examples or one of your own amongst your own work of you sitting at the table um, to work on a little exercise and just kind of dig into it and get our hands dirty and see what emerges from that process. Okay, so we want you all to be engaged and interactive. It'll be a good time for discussion at the end. And again, there are a lot of experts in the room who have been working on this um, very deeply for a long time. We really hope to hear from you as well. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex. Thank you, Peter, and welcome and good morning, everybody. And congratulations for coming to the most important session of all. <laughs> I would say that, wouldn't I? You know, metrics and measurement are the most important single issue in this space because they prove that we're being successful or that we're failing. They allow us to improve, they allow us to get resources. They allow us to be truthful to our mission. So this is a hugely important topic. So I'm going to make two modest proposals to you and then in about eight minutes summarize 10 or 11 years work in research around this. So don't say you don't get value for money <laughs> out of this kind of session. So it will be by, by nature somewhat superficial, I hope a little bit provocative. Okay, proposition number one, we have to be utopians. And what do I mean by this? Well, you'll know there's a long history of utopian thinking going back to uh, Plato and going through uh, Thomas Paine and Hobbes and Burke and others, allowing us to think differently about the future. And here's um, Thomas More's cover for his book entitled Utopia, but also wonderful examples like uh, Robert Owen and New Lanarkshire, so an incredible example of early you know, cooperation, cooperative um, uh, organization around an industrial area that, for example, had the world's first crash, uh, the world's first free education for children. Uh, a utopian idea, 1800. Nobody else adopted this at the time. People thought he was crazy. It was very successful, and now you think about a welfare state being built on this, or garden cities here. Ebenezer Howard's idea of having environmentally friendly and, and human friendly uh, architecture and design, again considered crazy at the time. Now we're all trying to think about how we organize urban areas. So these people thought differently. They saw a future that was not the present, but imagined how it could happen and tried to enact that. So utopian thinking, <laughs> Gibson's famous quote here, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. We have to find out where the future paths to a different world lie, <coughs> grasp them and move with them. As Roberto Unger famously said, we have to look for the adjacent possible. So not the possible we think is inevitable because of where we are now, the path dependent possible, but something that's just adjacent to that, a different future, a dis different possibility. Because by rethinking the future, we can actually change today. Today doesn't have to be a prisoner of the past. It can be, it can be freed from the past by rethinking the future. So that's the utopian idea. But proposition two, we must be realists. Okay, you know, I've, be, I've been fortunate enough to come to all 16 Skoll forums from the very beginning. Um, and there's an awful lot of utopia here. And that's great because it's motivating, it's inspiring, and it's brilliant. But we need to be realistic too. And this is where the measurement piece comes in. We need to be honest to what we're actually achieving and what we can really achieve and see ourselves in systems, not necessarily uh, overhype it. So if you haven't read this book, it's an interesting book. It comes up with practical utopian uh, opportunities and ideas for addressing big problems. So let's be realists, but let's be utopians. Okay, but let's stop the hype, okay? <laughs> Provocation one. 
there's lots of talk about systems change and lots of different words and phrases, ecosystem change, equilibrium change, lots of nice words about this stuff. We all want to be systemic. We see the world like this. You know, I've been around long enough to know that 15 years ago, everyone was excited by social entrepreneurship. Then they were excited about social innovation. Then it was impact investing, and now it's systems change. So these are words we have to use very carefully and when we think about the reality of what we're talking about. So let's avoid the hype. Because the truth is the most examples of this stuff we study here and we, we celebrate here are not systemic in their change. They're working within systems, they're diagnosing systems, but they are not changing systems. Let's be clear on that. Most social entrepreneurship and uh, activities in this area are working at micro or meso level activities. They're not looking at the macro level. I'll explain that a bit, a bit more in a minute. And there are, there are examples, of course, which contradict what I'm saying. But let's be honest about that and say, well, what are we really doing? What can we achieve? So what many organizations are doing is diagnosing the system's problem. So they're, they're understanding a huge problem like climate change or access to education or health, and they're pulling apart pieces of it and trying to address pieces of it. And that's really important and powerful, but it's not necessarily systemic. So understanding your level of action is important. You know, what am I actually doing here within a system? Is it micro level, meso level, or something aiming for the macro? And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. But let's be careful about overclaiming, which is why measurement is so important. It holds us true to what's actually happening, rather than what we think is happening or might like to happen. So what do we mean by system? And so this is what I would say, um, and there's lots of words on here, but I mean, you'll be aware of things like wicked problems. Hands up if you know what a wicked problem is. I won't call you out, don't worry. <laughs> this is not an MBA class, don't worry. Um, so these are problems that are hard, if not impossible, to resolve in and of themselves. They're too complex, too difficult, too systemic for a single neat solution. I mean, climate change, obviously, is the big example here. Doesn't mean we have to give up, though. So this is the Weberian cage. It's that we are trapped in a set of social structures that don't allow us to even think about how we get out of them, which is why utopian thinking is so helpful. It takes us somewhere that's not in the current system. And let's just think about that. So, you know, dynamic arrangements of, of, uh, of institutions that do these following things would be what I describe as a system. So it has different action, organization. It has power inherent in it, which is very important to understand. Systems enact power. So when you think about confronting systems, never forget that. There will always be people who want to stop you doing what you're trying to do. People for whom the system has a vested interest in not changing. And they can be very powerful figures. I won't name them, but you can imagine some of them currently around the world, right? Now, also systems frame how we think of the world. They frame the, how we, what we think is legitimate. And this, again, has to be escaped. This is the, the iron cage we have to escape. We have to say people think, you know, a system is legit, legitimizes action. If we want to change the system, we have to change how we see legitimacy. And they're full of discourses and institutions, things that perpetuate sometimes challenge existing arrangements. And that opportunity to challenge is what we have to focus on. How do we challenge institutional arrangements by understanding the system and where we can have effects on it? Does that make sense? You're still with me? OK. So this is one way of thinking about it. And this, uh, this draws on um, a four and a half year project we did uh, across the European Union with colleagues in seven countries looking at the institutional arrangements that were perpetuating marginalization. So we looked at the most marginalized populations in seven European countries, and we tried to understand what is making them marginalized. And of course, the point, the poor are not poor because they are stupid or ignorant or because they, are, they lack the abilities of the rich. It's because systems keep them poor. And if you want to stop them being poor, you don't just give them money or even necessarily create jobs for them. You find out what is it that's keeping them poor. And that's what we really understood in this research project. So we came up with this kind of um, uh, a configuration of, of three issues to defer, <coughs> define what needs to change in a system. So it's institutions, cognitive frames, and social networks. I'll say something briefly about all of those in a minute, because I'm on a tight schedule here. So, so therefore, systems change for us was a change in this relationship between these three organizing elements at the macro level of society. And material is, is a word from accounting here that represents changes that are relevant to what we're trying to do. So not overclaiming changes that have nothing to do with our project or our initiative. Being clear that you know, our impact has to be evidence as being to do with our action, not somebody else's. So let's be, again, honest about that and not overclaim. So this was the elaborate <laughs> diagram that you'll be, you'll be relieved to know is only a third of our theoretical framework. 
I've saved you the other two pieces, <laughs> which, uh, which elaborate it. But this is, again, the macro piece. So this is the high-level uh, you know, systems controlling framework. And the other pieces we included were, were a power framework, which explained how this gets enacted in people's lives, and then a capabilities framework to look at what was actually happening in people's real lives as a consequence of the enactment of these issues through power structures onto their lives. So that was the kind of model. But this is just the top level. So you see those three in the boxes, the three things I mentioned, institutions, social networks, and cognitive frames. So these are the three things we see as the organizing principles of systems. So I guess social networks are self-evident. These are the way people, ways people organize. Cognitive frames are the way that people see the world. So these are our perceptions, the way we understand the world operating. And these are restrictive normally. These limit our ability to think beyond them. That's again why utopian thinking, the adjacent possible, is so helpful. It takes us out of a cognitive frame. Um, you know, neoliberalism is a cognitive frame, much criticized. And institutions are, are the, um, the way that, uh, that discourses in cognitive frames are organized either in actual institutions like banks or governments or markets, but also sometimes in institutional structures around discourses, culture. So it's a broad, broad um, bucket. And all this is saying is that, it, is that these three things interact with each other dynamically. That's the arrows. They affect each other dynamically. So another important thing about systems change is to understand the system's changing as you're in it. <laughs> it's that classic uh, analogy of the fish swimming in the water, right? Sometimes you can't see the water. So when you go into systems change, be aware that as much as you're changing something, other things are changing at the same time. And be always cognizant of that. Because the way people see the world, the way people organize in networks and communities, and the way institutions form change all the time as you're in them. Does that kind of make sense, that framework? Yeah? Is that, so so it's, it's quite complicated, but, but the key thing is these, we would suggest these three, um, these three organizing principles, these sets of activities and, and ideas create systems. And if we want to start addressing them, we need to look at the, at the three boxes, but also at the relationships between them. Where can we leverage? a change in cognitive frames to change institutions? Where can we organize a social network to push against institutions or existing ways of thinking and so on? So it gives us an opportunity to map out where we uh, might focus our efforts. Okay, final, final piece from me. Um, the measurement thing is, is, a, is a bit of a red herring here. People think measuring impact is difficult and possibly even impossible. This is a complete fallacy. Measuring impact is easy. The problem is, is the measurement appropriate to what you're trying to do? What does the data tell you? Who cares about it? What are you going to do about that data? You know, we've got 60, 70 years of welfare economics and other mechanisms to measure impact on people's lives, the climate. This is not the problem. People think it is. It's not. The problem is what's appropriate measurement and useful measurement, and then how do we respond to it? So there's no single method of measuring this stuff. Systemic or non-systemic, whatever level we're at. But there are plenty of ways of doing it. Don't get hung up on that. Pull them off the shelf. There's plenty of stuff. And if, I, if you want to get guidance on this, drop me an email. I'll send you a three-page, you know, simple, simple um, kind of guide to how to measure stuff with, with examples of different methodologies and click-throughs to go and find how to do it. That's not the problem. So judgment matters, though. So you need to be able to make good judgments about what you're measuring, why, for whom, and with what method. So your, your professional judgment, your sector judgment is going to be important here. And material, materiality is key. You know, what's relevant data? You may want to do quant and qual. You may have to do interviews and case studies and close work with individuals. You may want to do big quantitative data studies or both. Don't get hung up on one being better than another. Numbers are not the best way to show impact necessarily. Stories, narratives, experiences could be just as important, if not more important. So be open to that. Don't get seduced by numbers just because funders tell you they want them. <laughs> be real with them. Okay? Um, think about the level of you operate at. So are you, are, you, are you micro level, community level, are you meso level, like markets maybe, or are you macro trying to get to those big three buckets? Where are you operating? What are you trying to do? That will determine what you measure and how you measure it. And think about time, and I'm nearly finished now. I'm not sure if I'm running over time or not. Okay. Um, you know, one of the cute things I think we did in our project for the EU I mentioned was 100-year case studies of four social innovations. And nobody ever does that. You know, they say, okay, my social innovation started yesterday, and it's going to solve poverty, 
And in a couple of weeks, I'll tell you we've done that. Uh, you know, which is great, you know, great enthusiasm, tiggerish enthusiasm. But take, take a historical perspective. So we looked, at, we looked at clean water, for example, and social housing. And you, when you see how those important innovations develop over a 100-year period, you see how those three boxes interact, how institutions and cultural discourses and organizing and social networking and politics and power and money affect the development of these innovations. What we saw was an interesting kind of curvy pattern. You know, sometimes these innovations were given much support, sometimes they were blocked, sometimes you needed events like a world war <coughs> to disrupt the trajectory. But it, you know, I think that's a cute thing and we, we enjoy, it. it's just interesting. So think about the time point of analysis. Think about when you're taking the data and what that will tell you depending on is it this week, next month, next year, seven years, a hundred years. Your impact could look very different over that time frame. Okay, so just finally, before we move on, this is kind of what I would say, and this is what we teach our students. So how do you get on with understanding systems change? We map the system, right? You work out what the system looks like, who are the players, where are the pinch points, how do those three boxes uh, I mentioned fit into a systems map? Then you understand where you're going to operate in that systems map. Where can you have the most effect? Given your skills, your interests, your funding, your <coughs> size and scope, whatever it is. Then you're going to diagnose what are effective in interventions. You've understood the system, you've understood where you, uh, you sit in it, you've probably understood where other people sit in it too, and you've diagnosed what you can do to try to affect systems change from where you are. You seek collective action. <coughs> we are better together, as Robert Putnam famously said. You know, this is not, you don't change systems alone, you change it by collective action. And measure, manage, share, and learn from what you do. Because as I said at the beginning, getting your head around your impact is absolutely critical to being successful in this space. Okay, I'll move on. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So, yeah, so hi, I'm Anna. Um, I work in an organization who is trying to do systems change and we uh, work on massive issues like sustainable nutrition, 1.5 degrees, looking at supply chains. And we've been grappling with this question of how do we measure systems change? Um, and actually the question that I've been trying to think is like, how do we measure, if, if, if the system is constantly changing, then how do we understand that system as it's changed? The system is changing. So how do systems change? And if we can understand how they change, maybe we can understand our contribution to that systems change. That's all we're doing. We're not actually changing systems. We're contributing to that dynamic systems change. And um, as uh, Peter said, uh, we've launched something called the School of Systems Change. And our kind of key objective with that is trying to help practitioners. So that might be, all of you here are practitioners of some sort. If you're a funder practitioner, a social enterprise, an NGO, a business, trying to give you some of the tools and um, capabilities to actually apply these ideas, to, to go through those processes of diagnostic and strategy and building collective action, um, and try to give you practical ways into this so it's not all theoretical and it can be kind of useful. So hopefully I'm going to introduce some ideas um, about how systems change and how that might help us do measurement, and then we're going to try to apply that to our own projects and our, to our own work, or to some case studies that we've also given you um, in the room as well. So that's very much what we try to do. We run programs, we curate resources, um, we're trying to build a bigger community of people who are trying to create systems change. So how do systems change? And I, I uh, kind of been studying this for, for quite a long time, a couple of decades, in terms of understanding what can we learn from nature? How can we actually shift and, and understand what's happening? And in nature, actually, there are multi-levels. So um, uh, Alex has already talked about we need to look at what level we're working at. But interestingly about nature, and this is the top left-hand corner, that you know, the pattern of nature, the brain cell, has a similar pattern to the universe. And that the pattern of the way things operate actually has these multiple fractals, these kind of nested systems. So how can we understand our own intervention of where it is and what, what kind of fractal, what kind of pattern is it creating? And how is that kind of affecting a, a wider whole? How is that affecting those different levels? So that's kind of one idea of, of where, where are you located? Where, what's the boundary you're working with? When we look at the bottom left-hand corner, we often see trees and rivers and mountains, okay? But we don't often see it as process. We don't see things as relationships. 
the pattern of relationship. We don't see the rain coming onto the mountain that then falls through the glen, in through the trees, into the river. And actually, when we think in systems, we think about systems change, we need to think of these things as a process of, a process of, of movement, of dyna dynamism. So what's the pattern of relationships that we're creating? And not just thinking of it as the tree, but thinking it as the nutrients running through that tree coming from the soil and the earth. And that's really, really important. It's, it's a massive shift in the way we think about the world. The third thing is emergence. So this is the idea that systems and change doesn't happen in a linear way. Systems happen that nothing will happen, you're walking along, things are going. We know about this in innovation, you know, tipping points, we've been looking at this. But actually this kind of emergence, this kind of movement in the system is really hard. And when it comes to measuring systems change, we could be doing something for 20 years and actually nothing is, the system doesn't feel like it has shifted or tipped, but it doesn't mean that you're not creating <coughs> systems change, you're not creating the conditions for that emergence to happen. So how do you measure that? What do we do with that? And the final thing I want to do, because I work a lot with living systems, is that humans are living systems. The thing that we have that is different is consciousness. So it's an, consciousness is just an emergent property of us as living systems. And what does that consciousness give us? It gives us choice, it gives us judgment, it gives us the ability to say, what are, you know, so measuring isn't this external thing to ourselves, we are choosing what to measure, we're choosing what to see. We have the ability as humans, as systemic beings, to choose. And so therefore it's a lot about how, you know, how we choose to work and, and, and the role of measurement in what we're doing. So with those kind of lofty concepts, what does that start meaning for how we understand systems and what, what we do? So systems change, if, in my kind of language, is it is simply, simply the emergence of a new pattern of organisation, a new way in which the system is organising, okay? And we can understand that as both a process, so the process of continually creating change systemically, working with those dynamics, as well as an outcome. And we often get caught in this field about systems change as an outcome. The system has shifted too. Uh, we had this once and now we don't have that. And actually, there's something I want to get into this presentation, which is almost saying it's the structure of the pattern that is shifting that we want to think about as the outcome. So, and that is happening at these different levels. So these are the things we're going to be working with for the rest of the session, is the pattern of thinking and being, the mindsets, the cognitive frames that Alice was talking about, the paradigms. That's the deepest sort of, of level, the pattern of the way we think about the world. How are we shifting that in our work? The pattern towards, you know, what is the pattern we're creating towards a goal? We are choosing a lot of the goals. You know, the SDGs sets a framework for some of those goals. We all have the goals that we are, the big audacious goals that we're all working towards. How do we know that we are moving towards those goals? How are we changing the relationships and ways of organising? And how are we changing the flows and structures of the system as well? And this very much relates to um, Donna Meadows, who did work on systems dynamics. Um, and she looked at how do we understand our leverage? So we as interveners in the system are just leveraging change, okay? We are leveraging change and we're trying to understand where is our leverage? What are we actually contributing to this change? And there are different scales or different interventions that we're making. And I'm kind of proposing that these different, four different ways of looking at it have a different levels of leverage, okay? So there's the flows and the structures like how are we changing the flows and the structures and very much about the information flows, the resource flows, the structures of the system can be the, the, the physical structure, the transport system, the way things are, uh, the institutions and what's on the ground. But I'm more interested actually in some of the flows, the feedback loops, how is that changing? Where, what is, what is the, the ongoing dynamic that is happening? And that really relates to the ways we organize, the social networks as Alice was talking about. How are we organizing? And as change makers, we don't measure or pay enough attention to the way we are organizing, the shifting in power, the capacity in the system, the way we are collaborating. We don't value that enough. Even our funders come back and go, you know, a lot of the work we do is facilitating collaboration just to get people coming together. And they're like, but what has changed as a consequence of that? I'm like, the capacity in the system, the power shift is what we've achieved. And that's a really hard thing to sell, but we want to measure it and we want to say that it's really valuable. And that is because we're trying to align to new goals. So we're saying, how do we know that we're trying to shift the system towards hugely impactful goals? You know, I'm working on something about sustainable lifestyles, you know, really trying to address 1.5 degrees. It's near impossible. 
but it's a massive goal. So how can I know that the work we're doing is helping to align towards uh, you know, a reaching, you know, a, a ecological footprint that is below, helping us live one, below 1.5 degrees. How can we really say that we're working towards poverty? How do we know that our interventions are aligning towards that? And then the mental models question. Okay, and you talked about ne neoliberalism. You know, how, what is the fundamental way the world works? What is this system that we're working on? And how, could, how are we challenging that? Because a lot of that thinking and our mindset is informing the current systems and what we're doing and how do we start working towards that and that's a really big question mark I don't have the answer to that one it's a provocation on our sheet more than <coughs> more than an answer so we've developed some tools um, this one is kind of trying to build on loads of different frameworks and ideas um, the 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 idea is that all system work has has a central purpose there are systems practices which is that inner inner ring that it's almost like the process of systems change. Like, how do we know we're working at multiple levels? How do we know we are working at different time scales, understanding the patterns of the system, understanding power and agency? So when we're thinking about measurement, we're not just thinking about what is happening out there. We're also thinking about how are we creating change, the processes of creating change. And so how we measure as well, we need to measure in a way that is cognizant with that systemic practice. So we talked about stories, we talked about putting together you know, qualitative and quantitative data. It's like we're working with multiple methods is actually a key systemic practice of measurement that we need to consider. And then we've talked about some of the leverage points that are kind of how we leverage change. So this is just a, a stimulus and an idea of some of the resources and tools we use on the School of System Change to help people get into these quite complex ideas. And it, and it might not be self-evident today, uh, hopefully it stretches you a little bit and gets you thinking otherwise we wouldn't be here learning it's, it's, it should be kind of sort of self-evident but also tax you a little bit and get your mind into it okay so we're going to work with these four things I think I've said them enough and repeating myself so how so what might we need to measure we need to measure these four different things the structures the flows the patterns of relationship the interventions aligning towards a goal and so we're going to give it a go. We're going to give it a go and say, on some of your projects, and I've called it projects, a project could be a whole sort of social enterprise. It could be a whole endeavor. So use that word lightly. It can be whatever you want it to be, whatever the boundary of your, your work is. Um, and we're going to think about, in our tables, how are these four different levels? And in the worksheet we have here, um, I want you to kind of, in a moment, in a moment, um, get together on, in groups of three or four people on your table, and we maybe can help you guys as well have some sheets of paper, and choose either your project or I'm going to talk through a couple of case studies, and think about, you know, what are we measuring at these different levels? If we took this project, if we're working on this project, what would we start to measure? What would we start to look at? Um, and then it, you might get there, you might not. Like, how, how would we measure? How would we measure that? You know, do we use storytelling? Do we use um, kind of uh, indicators in the system that, that changes are happening? And, and I don't have full answers to this because I think all the, all the measurement methods are out there, but it's your choice of what you want to use. How would you go about measuring that indicator of systems change, that idea of systems change? So I'm just going to introduce three brief case studies that I think are, are contributing to systems change, and they are, they've been working with the Skull Centre, um, and their, their case studies of just saying, what if we looked at this work from this lens? What if we looked at these work? And we've got Liz and Matthew, and I don't know if Rupert's in the room. I don't think he is. Math and, um, Matthew and Liz in the room, who, who are the people who, who run these projects, which is great. So that's the, the form. So the Marine Stewardship Council, so they are trying to, um, you know, they're trying to change consumer behaviour on, on fish, on what we eat as fish. But what's their contribution to changing consumer behaviour? So we could measure consumer behaviour of fish, and that is an indicator. But actually what they're changing is the information flows in the system. They're changing the way we understand our preferences of, of, of eating fish and consumer. So they're really, uh, you know, a, a standards uh, council, and they're saying, how do we, um, how do we understand the, the, the marketing of fish? And they're changing the way we understand that as a product, as, a, as a, an issue, and they're putting information into the system. So what would it mean to measure that information change? What would it mean to actually look at that, not just at the end result, but also their contribution to change? The second one is Eye Alliance. 
And you know, this, this is very much a multi-sector coalition in the room. Um, and uh, how they're building capacity, they're ecosystem building, they're building funding, they're building relationships, they're building agency. So how do we value that work? We can start looking at, um, they, they're starting to look at um, impact through the numbers of access uh, actors, the, num the amount of resources, the, the governments who are integrating this into what they're doing. So they're trying to say, how do we measure the new capacity in the system for change as an indicator of systems change? How do we start understanding that? Um, and what would that look like for some of your projects and some of the work you're doing? And finally, One Acre Fund are trying multi-intervention. So a lot of system change projects are collaborative, but they're also multi-interventions. They're not saying that we do one thing, we do one thing to create change. They're trying to work at all these different levels, at policy levels, through to kind of small actors and incubating different ideas. And so how do you start knowing that these different interventions are aligning towards their goal, you know, in increased income for smallholder farmers? How do you know that your different interventions are contributing to that goal? And what does that mean? Okay. Just a really quick question. Yeah. Um, who's the audience for these different initiatives that you see? Sorry, microphone. Just, sorry. Apologies. Just, just to clarify, where you see the audience for these assessments of systems change, is it the your own inter, you know, your own organization and its donors? Is it just the collective that's working with you, in which case there might be other implications for methodology and for attribution questions? Yeah, we'll come back to more questions. I think with systems change, it should be both and. And the problem is, is a lot of funders or people are, are, are in a pa non-systemic paradigm of we are the people who give you money and we need to therefore have the results in the way that we want it. And the same with the facilitator and the people we're working with, which is we are the people who are facilitating this and we need to understand how we've helped you change. And how do we all sit around the same table? I mean, that's my simple thing. So, so I, there is a paradigm shift in, in measurement and impact assessment, which we're sort of touching on but not going deep into, that is also required from a systemic mindset which is almost saying, how do we all recognize that we don't understand the answer to this? And it is a developmental process. It is a process of really understanding how we measure and understand change. But unfortunately, you know, as many, I just read this book um, about dancing on the edge, as many systems changes know, we are working in the new paradigm of systems work, and we're working in the current paradigm of more linear measurements or more things. So I recognize that tension. I really recognize that tension. Um, and it is that dancing between those two things. Um, so it is a question of, of, again, judgment of who is it for and how do you play that game. But let's build our muscle today in terms of thinking about how, if we really would, you know, not thinking about who needs it from me, if I wanted to say my work is systems changing and I want to put more value onto that work at a system, what, what I'm actually contributing to the system, do these four different areas help me think, what do, would I measure here? How would I change that on my project? So we have the three case studies on the table if you want to use the, one of those case studies and have a look at it. Or you might, in your small groups, choose one of your projects and go, hey, let me try it out, help me try it out. You might be running a, 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 social, entrepreneur, um, a social enterprise or you might be running a project that you think is systems changing. Does this help you stretch your thinking in, in terms of measurement and what you would measure and maybe possibly how you might measure? So let's give that a go for 20 minutes or so. Um, we'll wander around and, and kind of help you, and we'll then get your I insights and ideas back. Oh, you're good. You're good. Okay, I'm going to try to remember to. I quite like in engaging conversations, but I've been told I've got to be strict on the mic so people who are watching this can um, can also hear. Okay, so what we'd love is just some you know, some reactions from your group. I don't need to know what you did as such. It's just more, you know, what insights do you now have about the question about thinking differently about systems change? Uh, or thinking differently, you know, how did it get you thinking differently? That's a lot of what we try to do is get people just opening up questions is much better actually than coming up with answers. Um, and did you have any insights about the question of measuring systems change? So it'd be great to hear some stuff from the room in terms of insights and then we'll come to some questions in a moment. I'm going to be pausing for the mic. Kind of want things to move, but yeah. And, and Tara, please, please introduce yourself. <coughs> yeah. Sure. 
um, Tarun Verma Lego Foundation. Uh, uh, thank you for sparking off the th 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 thoughts around the emergence and uh, how to spot the levers of change. I think uh, more than the exercise itself, itself, we had a really rich discussion around how can we take an example and spot the different levers and what roles we play. Mm. And I think that's uh, fairly unique uh, in, in, in the whole scheme of things. So not a question, just a good comment no, no, to say. No, I like that. It's good. Um, thank you for getting us kicked off. Yeah. So it's great. Roles in the system is a key thing. Like, what is our role? Other comments, reflections? Don't be shy. Down here, yeah. We were at oh, we've got to wait for the mic. Otherwise, I'll get told off. Yeah. We were looking at an interesting case study in Armenia, which is almost like a system of systems. Mm. And what struck me is that the further we pull back the lens, the sort of the bigger the scope, the harder it is to perhaps see attribution or mm. causality. Mm. Yeah. And but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing that, right? Because otherwise we if we aimed if we aim for the atmosphere we would never meet, reach the moon sort of idea. I think we one of the things we looked at was the struggle if you haven't got any baseline data set to work from. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. you've got nothing to kind of compare or build on, it was really complex. How, how do you start finding that? Because that's not what your skill set is. Mm -hmm. and how do you do that when baseline assumes static state as well? And we've been talking about dynamic movement as well, and that's a really good question. We were talking about the water sanitation hygiene sector and where there is an ongoing movement to try to promote systems change. And uh, one thought is that if we could get to a point where we actually have a single measurement system in a district or a country, it would be much easier to measure for contribution instead of attribution. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the mm -hmm. problems stem from funders who want everything attributed to themselves. And if we could find a way to get them a metric that they needed, but it was on a contributory basis instead of for attribution, that would be a help. Yeah. Marie down here. Thank you, Marie Ringler from Ashoka. We talked a little bit about how this is actually such a powerful tool for strategy development and that the lens of looking at this only from the perspective of, you know, who am I going to please with my numbers is probably, you know, leading us down into a really dark hole. Um, and the other thing um, that I think we also discussed was the power of thinking about this out of the box is really to redefine success. Mm -hmm. And not only redefine measurement, but actually you know, thinking beyond. Well, one of the things we discussed is if what we're looking at here is actually not a problem of market failure, but of human rights, mm -hmm. then what are the new actors that can be allies in solving this problem? Right? How do we go beyond what we thought about? as the obvious ones that we want to be working with. And then that becomes really tricky in terms of measurement because then all of a sudden the one solving the problem is not just me anymore. So I think there's a really big question he here for the sector about, you know, how do we make this a really creative exercise? Yeah, and I think we, when we were planning this session, we were going around in circles and we were saying measuring system change was a title. And we wanted to say, is it possible to measure system change? Because actually we recognised it was a strategy. So the fact that you've got there to, it's a really a strategy question. And actually measurement is just reinterpreting back into strategy. It's the circular nature of that. And so we, you know, there was like a provocation of going, the measurement question is big, but actually we're kind of interested at the, the bigger thing. So we might need to kind of invite Peter and Alex and we can have some questions as well as comments in terms of, you know, where is this leaving us? Where are we getting to with our questions? What is this raised as, um, yeah, thoughts that you're having as well as insights? Do you want to sit down, stand up? <laughs> All right. Yeah, hey. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, can we bring the mic back? <laughs> yeah, go for whatever. Well, I, th I think it follows up really well with, um, the comments that you just made, because when we were talking, we were talking a lot about how that there's a, actually a big disconnect between the system and the communities that we're working in. And so even starting from a strengths-based place of maybe not rewiring, but just identifying where there might be some connections, even if they're somewhat weak or not very strong, 
um, in order to foster those partnerships because I think when the value systems between the systems and the people who are trying to function within those don't align, then you know where are we left? Um, and that power dynamic that you also mentioned in the presentation. So we were kind of grappling with those issues. But shouldn't those the community members should be part of that system, right? Yeah, and that's what we talked about. Um, so we were talking about um, the idea first to understand and identify, um, and then identify each other's needs, um, bring people together and form those partnerships. And we kind of talked about taking this um, sort of design here and how do you sort of deconstruct that to then look like a circle with everyone around the table having that conversation. Can I say, yeah. a, can I say a couple of things? So um, in our elaborate model, just to be self-serving for a moment, I mean, we, as I mentioned, highlighted the, the enactment of institutions being through power mechanisms. The way we looked at it was to try to unpack what those power mechanisms were across different categories of power to understand how you might get from that systems analysis to the community. And when we did our kind of capabilities analysis of, uh, for example, the Roma population in Hungary, one of the most marginalized populations in Europe, um, and we, we explored with them how interventions were helping them become you know, more <coughs> able to realize their capabilities, a striking thing they, they said to us was allowing us to organize, to have a voice in the choices people are telling us to make with our lives is one of the most important things. So this was simply to say, by understanding the power dynamics and how powerless they were in that universe of change and addressing that, you automatically improved the likelihood that their capabilities would be resolved. So power is so important here. Be aware of it, unearth it, challenge it, find ways around it. That's what perpetuates systems people with power and institutions with power. And one other thing briefly to say about, about, about data, you know, you'll know things like the Lean Data uh, Project and others that have really put the voice of the community at the heart of the data collection process about impact. And this to me seems a really important model, not only because it's likely to give you better data than you know, kind of proxy data, but also because it is empowering in itself to give people voice who've had typically no voice before. So I, I, that's just some observation. Um, you mentioned uh, Mar Martin Burt with uh, Poverty Stoplight. You don't talk about structural <coughs> change. You talk about systems change. Can you uh, remind us when, when it quit being structural <laughs> change and it became systems change? <coughs> Stru for me, structure change is part of systems change. You know, the, the, the structures... Actually, when structures change, that is, it is a lower leverage to kind of some of the other things that are making it. So it is part of it. The system is structured. Um, and it, but it's what structures are we talking about? And how do we see structures not as the hard stuff, but the pattern of the structure? So, yeah, uh, it is definitely part of systems change. System is just bigger than structure. I, that's what I would. Sorry. Yeah. I, would, I would purport that systems is a frame by which we can understand the way the world works and therefore how you look at things like structure or institutions or power. That's my view on it. Martin, I have no idea, so, <laughs> so just, you know, I defer to my colleagues. <laughs> uh, I'm Sarah Shear from Eco Agriculture Partners. Um, I had a question about you, the experience you've had with different global change um, in, initiatives about the value of doing the system change monitoring and having some groups participate in what is changing across all these elements as distinct from those specific areas where the where particular organizations decide that they're going to choose and how important it is that it feels in our situation we're looking at <coughs> transformation of land management uh, from lo to get local empowerment over decisions around all the aspects of land in a landscape. Um, so it's really important to work at that level. That's where we're intervening. But we need to be monitoring what's going on globally to see whether things are going to completely undermine that. And I, I don't know, in terms of division of labor between actors and relative weight of, of, of effort, how important those two as aspects are. You go for it. Um, well, we did say about kind of understand your, your level of action is the first thing. So work out. I mean, you can't fix everything. So work out what your objectives are as an organization. And it might be that you see a system that you can address on the ground very effectively and that's that's your contribution 
or you might think you want to develop you know, a political movement that will move policy regulation and that's your objective. So understand where you want to operate. You can't do everything. But also understand who else is in the ecosystem, I think, is important. And the thing about this model, anyway, the one we did, is it's a heuristic model, right? It's not deterministic. It's supposed to help you think about some of the issues and then go forth and be brilliant. It's not to say you have to do it this way. It's like alerting you to what I think, anyway, we think are some of the issues and ways of conceptualizing these incredibly difficult problems that might help spotlight where you can be effective. And just, just to challenge you also, that there's a perception of the concept of system change that as we're doing our work here and the system changes up here. And actually it's the interconnected, it's the multi-level part of the system change that is really important. And we are always acting locally. We are just individual human beings doing our individual thing. And so, it, but, it, but it's, it's understanding how we're leveraging it at those multi layers and being able, you know, the key thing in a lot of our programs that people really struggle with actually is multi level thinking. And you're saying it's all very easy, but actually, when you're really exercising your brain to, you know, the zoom in, zoom out, the multi level thinking on our systems practice, we come back to that like, wow, actually, actually being a systems change agent is somebody who is knowing that local work and how it re and how it is tracking on the big issues of climate change and knowing that that might be coming your way or knowing what is happening in the political sphere and you you're not actually changing that system what you're doing is you're understanding how that relationship is is working so again it's moving from thinking of system change is out there and we are doing our thing here or how do we you know how do we actually work at a system level you don't really you work with the dynamic of the changing system. And that is just a subtlety. And I think it's a really careful language we have to use because we of, often talk about an innovation. You know, innovation, then we scale, and then we have systems change. It's the, uh, the idea that it's that kind of, and that's the mental model that isn't systemic. So I just, just got to be careful with, you know, I'm just noticing language like that. So sorry to pull you out on that. Yeah, I, I just want to thank you, first of all, for this session. It's been really thought-provoking. And I think t I'm Leslie Flynn. I'm from Partners in Health. And um, I, I think that multi-level thinking is really also relevant when we talk about power. Mm. Because to a patient, the doctor may have power. Mm -hmm. But to the doctor, the Ministry of Health has power. And to the Ministry of Health, <laughs> the WHO has power. and we have to, th I think we have to just keep thinking about the fact that we're trying to build power all along the dynamic and it's by listening to the, to the folks at the base that, that we actually give real power to the folks along the chain. And it just, I just feel like the, it, it, you're really impacting the way I'm thinking about this as we as we try to move forward. Yeah. And there's a mental model here, which I don't know how many of you hit the how do you, how do you look at mental models and how do you look at that? Because the mental model is in systems work that the, the, the higher powers are here to serve. So you say the base, and we kind of see it as that hierarchy. Actually, they're there to serve that. And we get, this is, the bit, this is almost like the paradigm that has caused a lot of the systemic problems we now see. And so the flipping of that concept of power as well, of we as the WHO are here to serve the governments, are here to serve the doctors, who are here to serve the patient. And it's subtle, but it's, it's a mindset that we don't, we have to kind of exercise the whole time of what is our, our, our serving, who are we doing? And we've done that with our environment as well. We think the environment here is here to serve us. And we actually, you know, we call it ecosystem services. You know, it's like the wrong way around. We have the power dynamic in the wrong way around and we don't see ourselves embedded in what really, you know, really is going on. So it's, a, it's, it's And we have to be realistic that, as I said earlier, the, you know, the systems are perpetuated by people who have no interest in changing them, who tend to be the richest and the most powerful people. So none of this is ever going to be easy. If you look at the history of, you know, what I would actually think are systemic changes, say civil rights, for example, these are long haul, you know, changes that there have to be relentless, multi-systemic, collective, and, you know, and repeatedly opposed all the way down the line. Uh, but that's what you've got to do. Hi, Odin from Ashoka. Um, I love the whole idea of monitoring progress on a systems level. Uh, makes a lot of sense to me. The point that I'm struggling with is the attribution part. 
Um, if we understand impact as the difference to what would have happened otherwise, and we <coughs> operate on higher level social systems now, the counterfactual is really not clear at all. No. You could even argue that it's impossible <coughs> to establish because there are no, no control groups ever possible. There are not 100 worlds and we do our intervention in 50 and the other, th that's not gonna work. So how, how can we even in principle talk about impact on a systems level? I mean, I've got I mean, an answer. Yeah, yeah well, think. I mean, you're right about the question of attribution. The, 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 the whole point about metrics when we teach this is fit for purpose, right? So there's no metric system in the world, including financial accounting, that's accurate. There's no such thing as truth. I mean, don't be seduced <laughs> by numbers to, to our colleague over here. I mean, the financial world wants us to put numbers around impact because that suits their way of seeing the world. That's not the way social impact operates. So, of course, you can't come up with some totally hokey completely unbelievable system of trying to track your effects and impacts. But I think we certainly shouldn't get hung up on the not being an RCT for a system. I, don't, I think that's completely the wrong question we should be asking. We should say, is there, a, is there a measurement system that's fit for purpose enough for us to make some reasonable claims about our moves within a system? And you know, if, if we can get that, that's good enough and should be good enough. And there's some complexity scientists who go to the other extreme, which I'm not necessarily advocating, to the point is, it's just about the quality of the work that we put into the system because what we put into the system becomes the system. So it's even like who am I and who am I showing up as and the, the inner work of me is actually the, the, the knowing of that. And, and I'm not saying that you can't then do the other yeah. the measurement and go there, but there are some complexity scientists that go, it is almost, it is not possible because, but therefore it doesn't come about what do I measure? It's like, what's the quality of the work? How do we know this work has quality uh, and, and I did a PhD in, in, in action research and they don't talk about validity, they talk about quality of work. And that's like, how do you know that you're working in relationship? How do you know that you're being reflective? How do you know you are, you are being adaptive? And that is the key quality here, not necessarily. I mean, it's a chat, that is a paradigm of measurement that's over here. And I'm saying, look, we need to dance between these. That's my view is we need to dance between them. But there is a view there that also just kind of s sort of sits with that place. Hi, I'm Hannah Polly Williams from the International Rescue Committee. Uh, we were talking in our group about the sequencing of some of these characteristics, and we came to the conclusion that because system change can exist without anyone having done the thought of the other boxes, it didn't need to kind of be a sequencing. So we were thinking as well about uh, technology companies and, and fintech and financial inclusion as real systems change that hasn't gone through some of this process. Be really interested to hear from you both on any um, perhaps more subtle overall system changes, almost like a wave that you're seeing right now that technology often gets talked about, but perhaps more, more subtle ones um, that will influence almost everyone's work in the room here because that system is just edging in a way over time as institutions and social networks change or the process changes. Yeah, and those, those are at the paradigm level almost, like what's happening. I mean, I say in our own country, Brexit and Trump and nationalisation in India and Brazil and how we're changing dynamics of governments and the power relation there. You know, this is a systemic shifting. We, ran a, we did a report called The Future of Sustainability that looks at some of these trends, but trying to dig deeper. You know, how we're valuing nature is shifting at the moment. Climate change, what's happening with the Extinction Rebellion, you know, these are massive tr signals, we talk about signals, future signals, of things that we're trying to tap into of a system that is changing. Where they go and what happens, you know, digital is the key, we're always online, what's, what's you know, uh, we're living in a world of carbon because of the system change that was very popular, you know, very uh, beneficial of industrialization, but now we're living with the consequence of that. So what's gonna be the consequences of technology, of what's happening, so it's not, it's, 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 then you have to put value judgment on it and you have to say, okay, what do I, how do I want to react with that world that's changing and how do I want to work with it? I hope that answers your question, but it kind of gives you some little snippets of things. Well, I, think I, I would also say that, I mean, when it, 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 systems change in the sense that I understand it and try to define it here is episodic. So it can happen very quickly and then nothing seems to happen for a long time. Um, and, you know, what history tells us is, is these quick shifts are caused by shocks. You know, and often that's quite hard for us to take on board, but it's the truth. So it's, it's war, it's violence, it's a, it's a catastrophe. Now, I'm not suggesting we advocate for that, but when we understand our place in a systems change landscape, we have to know there's a lot of heavy lifting. 
it can take a long time, but things can change very quickly. And I think, for me, looking around the world, we have never been in a more oppositional political landscape globally. It's not just in the US and Britain. It's, it's almost everywhere. Um, now, if I'm an optimist, I say this looks like we're about to hit a really big tipping yes. point. <laughs> and I'm hopeful that will be an opportunity. Um, but, it, you know, it's going to be difficult. And then, then what are the seeds that we're planting now? Because some of yeah. them, the fire might come and they might, we might not see the system change from our seed we're planting, but it might give us a signal of, or a thing that might be an mm. island of hope in the future. And that's also a, a philosophy of system change that's be like, I'm not creating systems change, I'm just creating some seeds that, and that goes back to the quality question. Do they have the quality of the future I want to live in? Hi, I'm Bruno de Felipe, Ashoka Fellow from Paraguay. Um, so one of the risks I see in, in this, uh, in working in systems change and, and in measuring it, is that it's very tempting to do it in hindsight and explaining your effect on, on a system, your, uh, your impact on a system after you did it <laughs> in some ways. And to that, on the other side, I see that um, there is a huge, uh, also missed opportunity maybe if you are planning for your impact in systems change because there are things that you cannot uh, anticipate that will happen in the process of trying to make a system change. Like mm -hmm. for example, Startup Chile, they probably were very successful in their uh, effect of, on the ecosystem, entrepreneurship in ecosystem in Chile. But one of the unintended consequences, the largest one has been the fact that they, w they improved the numbers in tourism in Chile and they have measured this in some ways. So if they would have done it for, for the wrong reasons, it, that would have never happened. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on, on that. It's an adaptive system, right? So you, right. it's not saying, I plan to do this and this happened. Actually, I plan to do this, something else happened. Does it matter? Was it good? Is it bad? Has I adapted? So that the actual measurement process is a, is a continually adapting a moving one. You know, it's, it's, it is a diff when you get into this, it's a different kind of like, I did this project, we tried to do this, and you're like, ah, okay, something else happened. I mean, but to that point, and uh, you know, I think it's an event tonight at the Foundry, I think we have to find a way of celebrating failure. You know, we are all in, in our jobs, you know, constrained by having to constantly say we're successful, <laughs> or we don't get funding, or we don't get promotion, or we don't get adulation. Somewhere, if we really want to address these people, we have to celebrate failure. We have to say, that oh, was a great project, it failed, but look what we learned from that and how useful that was. You know, if you're a normal entrepreneur starting up, no VC will touch you until you've got two failed businesses, right? Yeah. And then they'll fund you. And this, in our, you know, your first failure as a social entrepreneur, you'll never get money ever again. Yeah. You've got to get over that somehow. And it's dropping the hero mindset. Yeah, exactly. yeah. You talked about unintended consequences. Occasionally they're positive, as you said, but oftentimes they're negative, right? And there's so much. Um, of systems change that's sometimes about muddling through and it's almost impossible to get through a journey without having at least some little failures and when you're operating in deficits of trust it's how do you overcome that and how do you build organizations and, and coalitions with the resiliency um, to uh, to make it through those failures and I don't think that's something we really grasp very well yeah maybe the last question here or last point just a quick point that um, to me, systems change is a means, um, not an end. And, and at least in the work I do, we've come to it because we realize that if you want to get people sustainable services um, and cover everybody with those services, whether it's in water and sanitation or health, you don't really have a choice. You have to take a systems change, change approach because there is no other way to have those services continue once you stop doing whatever you're doing. So. Uh, that's a bit of a response to the last point, which is we're doing it because we see it as the only way to actually achieve the goal. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. We're just about at time. Would you like to uh, make a final thought or comment? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, the great philosopher Brian Eno uh, <laughs> famously said that in the modern world, we're nostalgic for a future that never happened. And I think the point about what I was saying at the beginning about the adjacent possible has to challenge that. We have to be utopian. We have to think about the possible future paths away from the present and the iron cage of the present and be utopians. But as I said, be realists as well and measure what we're doing. I think my right. answer. Yeah, I think 
really stretch your mind on what you mean by systems change and stretch your mind and just notice are you designing your measurement or your strategy or whatever you're doing within the way the world works so you know we we the world is complex it is systemic uh, and we treat it as if it's not as if it's divisible as if it's separate and so our problems have come from that so if we are having to do systems change how are we designing our measurement if that's what we're interested in or our strategy or the work that we're doing on that basis and that for me you know, then, then go and measure what you like and do it how you like, as long as it's coming from that mindset. Great. Well, listen, thank you all for your attention. Um, we appreciate your efforts. Uh, really grateful to Alex and Anna, who both teach amazing courses on this at their respective institutions. And enjoy the rest of your week.